Thank you for joining us for this month's Virtual Curators Tour. I'm Jenna Gilley, Associate Curator of Exhibitions at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, and I'll be your tour guide today. We will be looking at the exhibition, The Art of the Skateboard, curated by Joseph Zimmerman and sponsored by Herschel, Santa Cruz Skateboards, and Vans. The first section of this four-part exhibition focuses on the history of skateboarding and the art of Santa Cruz speed wheels. Skateboarding first appeared in Southern California when surfers took the idea of surfing to the streets. Needing a way to practice when the waves were low, the first skateboards were made from simple wooden planks with steel wheels and other roller skate parts. Abandoned lots and downhill slopes served as asphalt surfer turf. Following a spike in the economy after World War II, the first official skateboard was made by the Roller Derby Skate Company in 1959. An example of one of these boards is seen here. Note the board's small, child size, and metal wheels. In the 1960s, skateboarding had its first surge of popularity. The introduction of softer clay wheels made skateboarding a more dynamic sport. The first skateboard magazine, the first skateboard park, and the first broadcast skateboarding competition were all made before 1965. Skaters began experimenting with board shapes and designs, the most common being a small, rounded shape, which evoked the modern designs of the time. Despite growing interest in this new sport, skateboarding suffered its first of many crashes, coinciding with the crash in the stock market. By the end of the 60s, it was dismissed by many as just another passing fad. Skateboarding survived thanks to the many different technical innovations that radically improved the experience. In 1972, Frank Nosworthy recognized the potential of the urethane wheel for skateboarding. The urethane wheel was softer and grippier than the clay wheel, making it far easier to skate in different environments and pull off more tricks. Santa Cruz Skateboards was the first company to use precision bearings instead of loose ball bearings with the introduction of the Roadrider 2 wheel making it possible for skaters to conquer new terrain and maneuvers. This board from the early 70s shows the evolution from the 60s to the 70s. It still features clay wheels and a smaller, rounder shape, but the board has begun to elongate slightly. The opposite side also features grip tape, a new innovation. Company typographic graphics were still the main form of board decoration, soon to change in the 1980s. Despite all the improvements, new tricks meant more risks. Many skate parks could not afford the rising insurance costs, and many kids who grew up skating began to age out of it. Near the end of the 70s, the skate industry fell deep into its second crash. Through the 80s, skaters had to take a more do-it-yourself approach to skateboarding. Safety bans and restrictions forced skaters to build their own ramps and half pipes, or get creative with their urban environments. Street style was born. Skateboard truck manufacturers founded new magazines to promote their products with Northern California-based independent trucks launching Thrasher and competing Southern California-based tractor trucks launching Trans World Skateboarding. By the mid-80s, skating was reborn yet again. This era spawned memorable graphics, often inspired by rock and punk music, and made household names of many professional skateboarders like Tony Hawk, Steve Cabero, and Mark Gonzalez. This board from the mid-80s features a much wider deck width and urethane wheels with the Santa Cruz Skateboards Red Dot logo. As it goes, another crash hit in the early 90s, but skaters knew what to do, take it back to the streets. A gritty, raw, edgy version of skateboarding was born. The skateboard went through its final main evolution during this phase, settling into a deck width of 7 to 9 inches across and 30 to 32 inches long. By the late 90s, wheels were much smaller, making it easier to pull off flip tricks at the cost of reduced speed. The advent of the X Games in 1995 reignited mainstream interest in the sport, leading to a huge rise in popularity by the early 2000s. By the 2000s, mainstream media and the popularity of skateboarding video games brought a larger scale commercialization to the sport. 
In 2001, more people under the age of 18 rode skateboards, 10.6 million, than played baseball, 8.2 million. Although traditional organized team sports still dominated youth programs. Skateboarding and skate parks were viewed and used in a variety of new ways to complement academic lessons in schools, including new, non-traditional physical education skateboarding programs to encourage youth to have better attendance, self-discipline, and confidence. Skateboarding continues to see new innovations in design, style, and audiences today. Electric skateboards and self-balancing unicycles are on the rise, as well as longboards and penny boards. Skateboarding made its Olympic debut at the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo with both men's and women's events, an official acknowledgement of the sport after almost 70 years. Through the ups and downs, booms and crashes, one thing remains true. Skateboarding is constantly evolving with new tricks, new terrain, and endless possibilities. Its individual and creative nature means there's no right or wrong way to do it if you push yourself to your limits. Now that we understand a little bit more about the history of skateboarding, let's jump into the history of skateboard art with the story of Santa Cruz skateboards and wheels. The rebirth of skateboarding in the mid-1980s was a notable era of skateboard graphics. Artist Jim Phillips' surreal, comic-inspired designs for Santa Cruz skateboards, part of NHS Incorporated, quickly became synonymous with the sport. That same level of eye-catching art was also happening on skateboard wheels. Under the guidance of art director Jim Phillips and brand manager Richard Medever, Santa Cruz skateboards would flourish, birthing the Speed Wheel Santa Cruz brand family. This part of the exhibition features the creativity that burst from Santa Cruz skateboards from 1984 to 1991, which led to some of the most unforgettable skateboarding, artwork, logos, ads, photos, and videos in skateboarding history. In 1984, the Bullet brand started as a wheel and deck, the platform for skaters' feet company. Bullet wheels were the first wheels to feature full four-color pad printed graphics. Imagery of barbed wire, bullets, skulls, fire, and scorpions match the speed and aggression of the team riders and Santa Cruz advertising content and imagery. Soon after, the 1970s OJ wheel brand was reformed as OJ2. OJ's high speed, high performance shapes and urethane formulas were pro team rider driven and were produced in an array of bright colors that mimicked a nostalgic Southern California aesthetic. In 1985, Christian Hozoy joined the OJ camp and launched his own wheel brand, Hozoy Rockets. With a natural born showman leading the brand, higher, faster, and longer with flair ruled brand identity. Hozoy's Hawaiian and Japanese ancestry inspired wheel motifs which often features dragon, stars, and other Asian imagery. The Speed Wheels family was completed with the introduction of slime balls in 1986. Slime balls broke all the rules for gross and disgusting imagery and advertising. Guts, vomit, maggots, eyeballs, and toxic slime became trademark. The more over the top, the better. This was Jim Phillips' creativity at its best and Metaverse humor at its worst. Simultaneously, Jim Phillips' Screaming Hand logo created in 1985 would quickly replace Santa Cruz's red dot to become the primary brand logo and one of the most unforgettable skateboard graphics ever made. The style of Santa Cruz speed wheels set them apart from their competitors. The company combined young and edgy graphics with old school design techniques. There was no Photoshop or computers to assist graphic artists in creating their designs. Everything had to be done by hand. Here you can see a close-up of a graphic created by Jim Phillips for the Bullet brand. Note the blue planning lines underneath the final hand ink drawing and the whiteout used to crisp up edges and cover mistakes. Once a drawing was complete, a color mock-up was created, planning where colors would be printed. Once satisfied, the design would be printed on a color transparency, which would be continually copied and scaled down in size until the original drawing fit the circumference of a skateboard wheel. 
The final design would be sent to the printers and be copied on the wheel using a rubber stamp pad. Moving along to the next exhibition segment, we have seen how wheel art is made, but now we turn our attention to skateboard deck art and the modern skateboard artists of today and beyond the deck, showcasing the artists behind the skateboard. Early skaters often doodled or added stickers to personalize their boards beyond imprinted typographic brand logos. The earliest commercial skateboard deck illustrations are said to have been done by Wes Humpson and Jim Murray in the form of the iconic Dogtown Cross in the mid-1970s, which arose from the rebellious graffiti scene. Since then, skateboard deck art has become highly valued and collected, giving rise to new types of graphics and design seen in this exhibit. Many of the featured artists in this exhibition still create graphics in technique and style similar to the classic graphic ways of Santa Cruz speed wheels. However, others have totally different approaches. These artists not only produce some of the best deck art, but are also talented studio artists. One of whom is Dylan Goldberger. Goldberger is an illustrator and printmaker based in Brooklyn, New York. He attended Pratt Institute, studying under Dennis Mounette, and graduated with a BFA in communication design. Goldberger prefers the traditional methods of woodcutting or screen printing to digital art because he enjoys the physicality and engineering involved in the process. He has collaborated with notable retailers Vans, Deathwish Skateboards, Rome Snowboards, and publications SF Weekly, The Portland Mercury, and Thrasher Magazine. Intensely detailed narrative pockets scattered throughout Goldberger's work draw viewers in and keep them engaged. As seen here in Bridge Dogs, canines have overtaken an industrial skate park, hosting barbecues, debasing property, and of course, skillfully skateboarding. Goldberger found a way to transfer his typical woodblock print style to digital illustration in this example by drawing in white on a black background, mimicking woodcutting's process of carving negative space into a woodblock. As with many of the works in this exhibition, skateboard deck art begins as two-dimensional, handmade drawings. This grouping shows that evolution from paper to board. The second piece we'll look at is even farther away from typical skateboard art, as it was in fact not created to be a skateboard graphic, but rather a standalone artwork. Ode to Breakfast Cereal is an oil-on-canvas painting by Jason Arnold, who is an art director for NHS Incorporated in Santa Cruz, California. He's designed everything from skateboard wheels, trucks, and boards to advertisements for Santa Cruz skateboards. Here he proves that he is also a talented oil painter. In Ode to Breakfast Cereal, Arnold depicts two versions of Mad Magazine's smiling mascot, Alfred E. Newman. Mad, an American humor magazine known for its satirical articles and comic book covers, has placed Alfred in a slew of disguises and silly situations since 1954. To many, he is synonymous with childhood and the rebel mentality. By displaying this iconic character amidst a colorful array of our favorite sugary breakfast cereals, Arnold celebrates youth, fun, and an overall indifference to worry. Rendering a bright, colorful cartoon character in such a realistic, traditional manner also subverts our conception of what or who can make museum quality art. The third exhibition section, titled Inclusive, highlighting emerging underground skaters and artists, focuses on art created by and for marginalized and underrepresented groups. Co-curator Ken Harmon of Hashimoto Contemporary describes his idea for this section in the following statement. Historically, skateboarding has been, and always will be, a means of both rebellion and inclusion. Highly individualistic, the sheer act of skating in and of itself serves as an act of insurgency against the regimented homogeny of organized sport. Quasi-anarchic in nature, skateboarding eschews uniforms, rules, and coaches, instead pushing forward in pursuit of an idyllic world where self-expression, experimentation, and originality define success in the sport. This fierce drive for independence from the status quo 
coupled with its backward DIY roots, helped drive skateboarding over these past few decades into the cultural phenomenon we know today. As we enter the second decade of the new millennium, skateboarding culture continues to evolve in lockstep alongside its popularity, as does its propensity for nonconformity. Skateboarding no longer represents the singular serbanity of its past. Rather, the culture's ingrained rebellious nature now encompasses a diverse and eclectic cornucopia of senses, crews, genders, colors, people, identities, and movements. Much as early skaters throughout the 20th century created their own safe spaces in suburban backyards and empty swimming pools, hidden from organized sports teams and societal norms, so too today do we find a new generation of skaters carving out their own spaces and finding their own voices. While these groups have always been present, albeit often marginalized and underrepresented, the cultural and technological zeitgeist of today has finally provided a platform for these groups to connect, grow, and provide and create safe spaces of their own. Two of such artists who aim to shed light on the diverse world of skateboarding are Norma Ibarra and Jeffrey Chung. Norma Ibarra is a multidisciplinary artist and storyteller who has worked with top clients like Vans, Thrasher Magazine, and Vice. She grabbed a skateboard at the age of 31. While finding her balance on the board, she also found the home she was searching for, an ever-growing community of nomads, athletes, and visual storytellers, all dedicated to their craft and each other. Volunteering is Ibarra's main passion. She's actively involved with programs that help youth find a voice, particularly within her Mexican skateboard community. Bay Area artist and skater Jeffrey Chung first became interested in studying the human form taking figure drawing classes at night in high school. After being inspired by a queer printmaking workshop in San Francisco, Chung and his partner Gabriel established Unity Press, a zine company that aimed to limit censorship and encourage accessibility. In 2017, Chung expanded his reach from zines to skateboards, establishing Unity Skateboards. His brand, which features hand-painted nude figures of all genders, races, and sizes, hopes to illustrate that there is a place for everyone in skateboarding. The company places a particular emphasis on reaching out to queer youth, holding community queer skate days, and promoting giveaways by handing out flyers in local high schools. Unity Skateboards has held workshops across the U.S. and internationally, including this meetup in Munich, Germany in 2018. The fourth and final segment of The Art of the Skateboard is a skateboard installation with art by Dennis McNett titled Canyon of the Wolf Bat. Owner of Wolf Bat Studios, Dennis McNett received encouragement as a child from his grandfather, who always praised his drawings. Growing up, McNett was influenced by the raw, high energy of early 1980s skateboarding and the punk rock scene. Now known for his striking woodblock prints, McNett's work reflects his love of narrative and the graphic aesthetic. McNett chose the name Wolfbat for his studio after the Nordic character of reincarnated Fenris, who was viewed as a giant spirit that would wake people up, shake things up, and allow his followers to participate in all life had to offer. With Wolfbat Studios, McNett has created his own new crew of enthusiastic artists. When creating art for this exhibition, McNett was limited in a number of ways. As an art museum with quick exhibition turnaround times, McNett was unable to paint on the gallery walls as a typical muralist would. Therefore, McNett created a series of woodcut prints, which he enlarged and turned into stencils, adding hand-painted color for detail. Large printed tapestries also serve as immersive backdrops to transform the space into a southwestern desert. 
The two sides of the gallery are meant to represent night and day, with a rising moon and baths on one side, and a setting sun on the other. Large paper mache birds from the museum's permanent collection soar above the park to complete the scene. This park was conceived as an homage to the history of skate parks and the art and creativity surrounding them. The earliest skate parks were little more than empty reservoirs, pools, and other urban spaces, spread by word of mouth or skateboarder magazine. The California drought of 1976 promoted many homeowners to drain their pools due to water restrictions. Skateboarders soon took over, riding the pool's bold end and smooth walls to popularize vertical or vert skating. By 1982, partly due to the bump in popularity brought by pool skating, over 200 skate parks were built. As skate parks gained momentum, so did the surrounding architectural and visual art. Skaters already had to be creative in their thinking of how to interact with urban spaces to create new tricks. Skate parks allowed for spaces to be designed specifically for skaters' needs, resulting in new architectural shapes and design elements not found on the streets. Graffiti and murals started to populate the park as well as an extension of personal expression and regional style. Each park started to exist on multiple levels, as a functional engineered space and as a community work of art. This park, designed and built by Slam City Skate Parks and Dead Ed Skateboards, aims to highlight this duality. When in use, the gallery serves as a stage for the performative art of skateboarding. But even when static, the series of dynamic shapes and immersive art makes the Canyon of the Wolf Bat an art installation in its own right. Thank you for joining me on this trip through skateboard art and history. This tour just touches the surface of this dynamic exhibition, so I encourage you to come see it in person. The Art of the Skateboard will be at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art until June 12th. To see the Canyon of the Wolf Bat in action, join us for one of our upcoming skate nights. May 21st and June 11th will be open to all ages, while June 4th is reserved for kids 13 and under. All open skate nights are from 6 to 9 p.m. We hope to see you in the museum soon.